Hello, my name is Stephen Jones. I'm a mental health nurse and the professional lead for mental health at the Royal College of Nursing. It's a great pleasure that I join you on International Nurses Day to celebrate mental health nursing yesterday, today and tomorrow. A career in mental health nursing is like no other. Becoming a mental health nurse was the best decision in my life. I'm not a historian or an eminent academic and I don't claim to be an expert. However, I do claim to be a passionate mental health nurse holding a keen interest in understanding what mental health nursing is all about our unique history and shared goals. I hope this Morley College Penny Lecture is informative and inspires you to want to know more about the profession. I'll start today's lecture by briefly exploring the early role of the nurse, or more accurately, the founding origins of the contemporary nurse we know today. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the nurse was completely subordinate to the medical physician. Many of you have probably heard the term handmaiden, used to define the feminine role of the nurse in fear to that of the masculine physician. This power dynamic emerged within the socio-political context of the Victorian era. Early Victorian policies were underpinned by an authoritarian style of paternalism. To define it loosely, authoritarian paternalism is the action of a centralized and hierarchical power that sets out to limit the autonomy of another with the intention of bettering or promoting one's own good. Such policies were used to justify the disciplining, conditioning and controlling of young women who were the backbone of nursing at the time. The power dynamics between physicians and nurses of the Victorian era aligned with the socio-hierarchical structure of men and women. With the nurse depicted as a maternal figure and the physician being seen as a paternal figure. When exploring the morality of Victorian nursing, obedience is seen as a core virtue of the role. The place of the Victorian nurse resembles women's distinctive responsibilities to their husband, their family and society. This analogy has been well worn through a feminist critique of nursing. Gamarnikov described the relationship of the doctor nurse patient as relative to the nuclear family unit, male, female, child. In this sense, the Victorian nurse symbolizes the nurturer, the mother, caring for the needs of their patients, the children, while obediently following the directions of the physician, the husband, or at least making it seem as though he's calling the shots. And this was indeed the case. Senior nurses used their virtues of obedience to manipulate and influence the very physicians they were subordinate to, ultimately driving improvements in patient care while allowing the men to believe they were the ones who instigated it. Such dynamics were in parallel with Stein's 1967 view of the doctor-nurse game, with doctors having ultimate responsibility for patients. I quote, nurses had to be bold, have initiative and be responsible for making significant recommendations while at the same time, she must appear passive. This must be done in such a manner so as to make her recommendations appear to be initiated by the physician. This heritage is echoed within the role of the formidable hospital matrons who held the utmost power and control over their nurses and greatly influenced the decisions of the medical physician. Revisiting these assumptions more than two decades later, Stein et al. found that there had been a significant shift in the dynamics underpinning the doctor-nurse game, where both doctors and nurses practice with more autonomy and collaboration. Now we look at men in general nursing. We have explored the paternalistic power and difference noted between the Victorian nurse as a woman and the physician as a man. Interestingly enough, men wanting to enter the field of nursing faced equal prejudice from their female counterparts. The famous Florence Nightingale campaigned for the feminization of nursing. She argued that men were incapable of providing the caring, empathetic and intimate care the society required. Nightingale believed only women were able to possess such qualities as an extension of their maternal roles within domestic family life. Nightingale's highly stereotypical view of men in nursing was a further manifestation of the paternalistic nature of Victorian England, continuing well into the mid 20th century. It was not until 1951 that men were even allowed to join the same professional nursing register as their female colleagues, and not until 1961 that they could join the Royal College of Nursing. So 60 years ago, I would certainly not have been here giving a penny lecture as the Royal College of Nursing's professional lead for mental health. Despite the huge number of men joining the profession in and beyond the second half of the 20th century, debates around the feminization and defeminization of nursing continue today. Many went to enter nursing may still be considered unmanly by some in today's society. It has been argued that men in nursing have increasingly moved towards the more traditional patriarchal roles of management and administration. 
something seen as a hidden advantage for men pursuing a career in nursing, or in this sense, seeking a career through nursing. Men in early mental health nursing paint a very different picture. Traditional mental health nursing consists of largely of men. Using the explanation of gender relations to argue the power imbalances between mental health nurses and psychiatrists would be highly inaccurate. In the Victorian times, early mental health nurses were known as asylum attendants. Asylum attendants held more of a custodial role than the one resembling Nightingale's caring and nurturing female nurse. Despite the gender equality, attendants were completely subordinate to the asylum physician, who was known as the medical superintendent. The superintendent held complete control over every aspect of the attendant's life, where rule books outlined conditions of immediate dismissal if orders were disobeyed. This power imbalance has been explored and articulated in academic writing over the years by writing such as Goffman and Foucault. The same anti-psychiatry critiques that drove deinstitutionalization in the UK and partly influenced the emergence of recovery by those with lived experience of mental illness. We won't go into this history today, but deinstitutionalization and the concept of recovery are in themselves worthy of their own lecture and certainly worth looking up after this lecture. The emergence of antipsychotic medication has affirmed the dominant position of psychiatrists over mental health nurses. It also strengthened the biological argument for mental illness. This ensured psychiatry continued to lead and influence the direction of mental health care throughout the 20th century. Nursing education has its roots in the mid 19th century England. Florence Nightingale established nurse training in St. Thomas's Hospital, influencing the establishment of nursing schools around the world. By the early 1900s, many hospitals had established their own nurse training schools. Students undertook two to three year placements, providing free care as payment for their training and education. The education of early mental health nursing held slightly different routes. Despite the power imbalance within asylums, it was actually the superintendents who initiated training and education for asylum attendants. In 1885, the Medical Psychological Association produced the handbook for the instruction of attendants on the insane, commonly referred to as the Red Book. The Red Book covers the areas of anatomy, physiology, and the principles of nursing care, as well as mental illness. National training schemes for attendants were later developed by 1891 based on the content of the Red Book. Lectures on mental illness were predominantly given by psychiatrists, the quality of which said to vary. These lectures focus more on the theories and practices of early psychiatry than they did nursing. Attendants had to undertake oral and written examinations to show their knowledge. Successful completion of their training led to certification. Although seemingly empowering their workforce to learn, we must remember that the Red Book was created by the superintendents. Throughout the Red Book, there was the strong emphasis towards the total obedience of attendants under medical authority. Despite their new knowledge, attendants were not able to threaten the existing power infrastructure within the asylums. The role of general nursing was developed alongside general medicine. In an attempt to strengthen their identity as medical specialism, superintendents pushed the General Nursing Council to have mental health nursing accepted as a branch of general nursing. By the early 1900s, attendants had become recognized as mental health nurses. Or actually the term at the time is they were actually called mental nurses. The General Nursing Council had a statutory commitment of creating an educational syllabus for all nurses. Despite the intentions of superintendents to strengthen their own position as a medical specialism, their ambitions to make contendants a branch of nursing backfired. For 30 years, there was a rivalry between the General Nursing Council and the Medical Psychological Association over the ownership of the new mental health nursing role. By 1951, the now Royal Medical Psychological Association relinquished their e educating responsibility altogether. The General Nursing Council therefore maintained sole ownership over mental health nurse training across the UK. Ethel Gordon Fenwick was another famous nurse from Victorian England. In 1887, Fenwick founded the British Nurses Association, a union type organization somewhat similar to the Royal College of Nursing today. Fenwick campaigned for the state registration of nursing, believing state registration would help nursing become a recognized profession and gain a higher social status. Not all nurse leaders shared Fenwick's vision. Florence Nightingale strongly opposed the registration of nurses, 
might again believe that nurses were not educated enough or distinguished enough from medicine to become a profession in their own right. Where Fenwick believed state registration for nursing was the best route towards professionalization, Nightingale argued that only through education could nursing truly become a profession. The College of Nursing was founded in 1916, seconding Fenwick's ambition of creating a nursing register. The campaign for professional registration eventually led to the passing of the Nurses Registrations Act in 1919, establishing the General Nursing Council in 1920. All nurses had to be listed under a professional register. There was a general registration for trained general nurses, a supplementary register for mental health nurses, and the separate registration for male nurses. As I said earlier, men could join the general registration amongst their female counterparts until 1951. The majority of the General Nursing Council was made up of nurses from the College of Nursing. The college received Royal Charter in 1928 and became the Royal College of Nursing, as it is today, in 1939. In the 40s, the nursing workforce struggled to meet the needs of a war-struck society. The new role of state enrolled nurse was created to help registered nurses meet these increasing demands. Despite undertaking a two-year hospital-based training, similar to that of their nurse colleagues, the state enrolled nurse remained subordinate. Visions for nursing to move into higher education came about in and around the 1950s. There were also opposing views that nursing education should not be made too high. It was argued that many people without higher education would still make great nurses. The 50s also saw the emergence of the greatest pioneer of British mental health nursing, Any Altshaw. Altshaw outlined what mental health nursing should be like in her 1957 book, Psychiatric Nursing, and AIDS Psychology for Nurses, released in 1962. These books were the first in the UK to specifically focus on the clinical application of social psychology for nurses. Altro's vision for mental health nursing diverged from the traditional biological interventions of that time. As you can imagine, this didn't sit too well with many of her medical counterparts. Along with other renowned mental health nurses of her time, Hildegard Peplau and Eileen Skellern, Altrell highlighted the importance of therapeutic relationships in mental health nursing. Being present rather than absent and connecting with patients rather than being disconnected became core to mental health nursing. If you want to know more about the early pioneers of mental health nursing, Peplau, Altrell and Skellern, there is a link in the description uh, to an article that has explored their collective biography and definitely worth having a read. From 1962 to 1964, Altshaw was a member of an RCN special committee producing a prominent report recommending the reform of nursing education, first printed in 1964 and again in 1969. Another committee was set up by Asa Briggs in 1970 to review the role of nurses and midwives in hospitals and in the community. The committee recommended one national statutory body for nurses, midwives and health visitors, responsible for setting standards, education and training. The work of the committee resulted in the creation of the Nurses, Midwives and Health Visitors Act 1979. The Act got rid of the General Nursing Council and other nursing bodies, replacing them with the UK Central Council for Nursing, or the UKCC for short. The UKCC set up a new professional register in 1983, removing the state and rural nurses altogether. They focused instead on developing registered nurse education. In 1986, Project 2000, a new higher education scheme for nurses, set out to completely remove in-house training from hospitals. This created a one route entry for gaining a nursing qualification by undertaking a college or university diploma. The intention of Project 2000 was not only to produce nurses who were safe, but to produce educated nurses capable of improving the quality of patient care. By the early 90s, the students of mental health nursing were brought alongside general nursing students within universities. Although mental health nurses received the same educational footing to other areas of nursing, they lacked a discipline specific education compared to other mental health professionals, such as psychology and psychiatry. In 1999, an independent review of the Nurses, Midwives and Health Visitors Act paved the way for the creation of the Nursing and Midwifery Council or better known as the NMC, replacing all previous nursing authorities across the UK. In 2004, the OCN voted for nursing to become a degree-only preparation, 
By 2009, all nursing courses in the UK offered a degree level route. Up until 2013, nursing students had the option to either register as a diploma student or following down the degree route. From September 2013, all nursing programmes became degree only, completely removing the option of diploma. Over the past 10 years, you've probably seen in the media that nurses are overeducated and have become too posh to wash. Such a claim is unfounded in research. However, nurses are spending more time attending to the evolving technical aspects of the role than they are to the personal care needs of patients. Many nurses are performing tasks and interventions that used to be the sole responsibility of doctors. We must not forget the appalling treatment of society's most vulnerable at Winterbourne View and the atrocious scandal that took place in Midstaff's NHS Hospital Trust. The report of the Midstaff scandal, the Francis Report, recommended that nursing education needs to refocus to promote a culture of compassion and caring in nurse recruitment, training and education, with practical hands-on training being a prerequisite to joining a nurse training course. In response to the Francis Report, then Chief Nursing Officer in England, led the creation of a framework outlining the requirements of a safe and compassionate nurse. Care, compassion, competence, communication, courage, and commitment, better known in nursing as the six C's. Despite the drive for compassion in practice, the concept of compassion in practice is contested. Compassion is often viewed as either a skilled professional activity or an inherent characteristic. Such definitions have fueled the stereotypical assumption that good nurses are born and do not require an education to become a nurse. There remains no substantive evidence to suggest that a degree education contributes to or influences a nurse's level of compassion and practice. It is argued that compassion without clinical expertise is not enough to create the therapeutic relationships or to deliver person-centered care. An argument resonating with the teachings of mental health nursing's earliest pioneers. Nurses not only need to formulate what matters to patients, they need to be able to understand how the person's wider, often complex health status may affect their recovery or their general well-being. We can academically debate the concept of compassion as much as we want, but at the end of the day, the quality of compassionate care is going to be judged by those we serve, patients, service users, carers, and families. Like the wider health service, mental health nursing has had to adapt to the socio-political changes of the late 20th century, following the closure of the asylums and move towards community-based care. Mental health nursing has also attempted to move away from its psychiatric roots to be more socially and psychologically focused. As Barker and Buchanan Barker put it, modern mental health nursing implies something more meaningful, more egalitarian, more health promoting, and therefore more liberating than traditional psychiatric nursing. The historical power struggle between mental health nursing, psychiatry and general nursing underpins a lot of what mental health nursing is today. Some scholars argue that such influences may have hindered mental health nursing from developing a coherent professional knowledge base of its own. Since the emergence of empowerment, choice and personalization in UK policies of the early 2000s, power in the NHS has and is continuing to shift away from professionals and more towards patients and service users. Such a shift has created the need for flexibility in both practices and the organization of mental health services, while also challenging the control and power of professionals. In 2006, the then Chief Nursing Officer undertook a review of mental health nursing, aiming to answer the question, how can mental health nursing best contribute to the care of service users in the future? The key recommendation was, Mental health nursing should incorporate the broad principle of the recovery approach into every aspect of their practice. This means working towards aims that are meaningful to service users, being positive about change and promoting social inclusion for mental health service users and carers. The Nursing and Midwifery Council, the sole governing body of nursing in the UK, stipulates that registered mental health nurses must focus on social inclusion, human rights and recovery. That is, a person's ability to live a self-directed life with or without symptoms. 
that they believe is meaningful and satisfying. The NMC also specify mental health nurses must contribute to the leadership, management and design of mental health services. As mental health nurses in the UK, we have a professional obligation not only to implement recovery orientated practices, but to develop and improve services to make it possible. However, this is easier said than done. There are, of course, various competing priorities within and across the NHS. For one, mental health nurses work within a multitude of contexts and service settings alongside many other professional and non-professional groups. Each group has their own, sometimes overlapping, historical and political roots. These contexts shape their worldviews, how they see the world around them, influencing the way in which mental health care is delivered and services are devised, be it recovery orientated or not. Within mental health services, mental health nursing is the largest professional workforce. Mental health nurses have, by far, the most face-to-face -face engagement with patients, service users, carers, and families, both as inpatients and in the community. Mental health nurses are in a unique position to shape the very nature of mental health services in direct response to the needs of those that use them. Vacancy rates for nurses in the NHS continue to increase year on year, while the total number of NMC registered nurses continues to decrease. With the increased shortage of registered nurses, there has been the rise of the new nurse associate role to, as the Department of Health put it, bridge the gap between healthcare support workers and registered nurses. A role bearing the characteristics of the enrolled nurses of the mid 20th century. If nursing is going to remain safe and critically adapt to new and changing needs, a high level of professionally educated knowledge and expertise are vital. Nurses must pay as much attention to the quality of their interactions with people they care for as they do to the technical aspects of the role. We are in unprecedented times. The impact of the pandemic on the nation's mental health must not be underestimated. Nor must we forget the struggles nurses and other healthcare workers have faced this past year. We are seeing concerning statistics that suggest a huge number of nurses are struggling with their own emotional and psychological well being. Peplau and Ultra revolutionised mental health nursing in direct response to the social and psychological needs of society during and after World War II. As a collective profession, I believe we need to learn from our early pioneers and ensure we respond to the ever-changing needs of those who we are duty bound to serve. Over the pandemic, mental health nurses have led on new telecommunication support, such as helplines and chat services. We need to continue to offer flexibility to patients, which must still include face-to-face -face engagement to help build those therapeutic relationships. So newly emerging data is showing us that where teleconference calls and telephone calls have been beneficial for some, others have struggled, and we really need to ensure that we support our patients going forward. We need to be responsive to the needs of our children and young people where rates of common and severe mental illness have risen sharply during the pandemic. We must make sure we use our core social and psychological skills to support the needs of the public and the needs of our colleagues. It is paramount that we engage with those who use our services to co-create mental health practices of the future. We must also strive to remove the inequalities faced by people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds people who use, or in a lot of cases, don't use our services. We need to provide the platforms for our BME nurses, as well as nurses with lived experience of mental illness to truly shape and influence the future of mental health care. And I'm hoping that you will work with the RCN going forward in this important piece of work. We must also strive to look after ourselves, to give ourselves time to recuperate, to receive and provide clinical supervision. And clinical supervision that's effective, appropriate, and embedded within services. In a conversation I had recently with Hannah MacDonald, Anne is the RCN's expert representative for lived experience. With a service user hat firmly on, Hannah said, and I do paraphrase, 
Nurses should not feel guilty about taking breaks or prioritizing clinical supervision. For if they don't, they won't be able to provide the level of care they are striving to deliver. Service users and patients will be shocked if nurses are not taking the time or being given the time to critically reflect and improve their practices. Leaders of organizations must ensure measures are in place to allow this to happen. Thank you for joining me at this evening's International Nurses Day Penny Lecture on Mental Health Nursing, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I would like to thank my doctoral supervisors, John Crowley, Karen Cleaver, and John Foster for helping me to shape the content of this lecture. I want to take a moment to thank all of the nurses across the world working tirelessly to respond to the pressures of the pandemic. I hope this brief introduction inspires you to find out more about our unique history and the people that helped shape the profession of mental health nursing. In the description, I've added a link to the RCN's mental health library page. Here you can find the latest literature around the role of mental health nursing and mental health practice. If you're interested in becoming a mental health nurse, there are dozens of universities across the UK providing training. If you're not already a member of the RCN and you are a nurse or a healthcare worker, please come and join us. If you're a member already, come and join a growing mental health forum consisting of over 13,000 nurses, midwives and healthcare support workers. Only together as mental health nurses, service users, other professionals and those in our local communities will we achieve the goal of true person-centred care. And on that note, I would like to end this lecture with an oft-quoted ancient African proverb. If you want to walk fast, go alone. If you want to go far, walk together.